Man, good morning. Merry Christmas. Beautiful time of the year. What a powerful song. Lord, hear our prayer and come for us. Amen. All right. It's good to be with you this morning. The last Sunday of 2021. And uh, the word of God has been preached faithfully throughout the first uh, year, first Sundays, throughout the whole Sundays of this year. And may the last one continue to be preached to the praise of the, and the glory of God. Amen. So welcome to any visitors here. If you're traveling, if you're here with your family, um, may you see the triune God set on display this morning through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is our prayer that you would see him and that you would see his beauty and that you would know that he is the one true way way to God. Uh, The text we'll be using this morning is found in Isaiah chapter 43. And as you turn there, in the light of the season that we are in this morning, we look to the word of God, the word of God as it highlights that God is continually with his people and how that should impact us as his people. It's without a doubt that this time of the year is precious to those who are found in Christ. And so if you're found in Christ, you think about and you meditate and you dwell on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know how he came to his own and how his own received him not, yet he rescued us from the wrath to come, giving us the right to become his children. And we marvel at the incarnation of Jesus Christ because in the flesh, without losing his deity, he became as a helpless babe, born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, who would later grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and men. Upon coming Christ and receiving salvation, before we come to him, we then come to him and we learn about the beauty of this incarnation, and it means so much to us. So I pray that your Christmas was blessed, and as we continue on for the rest of this weekend, may your hearts be set on him. So, this morning, men search, and they search continually, and they come up empty, and the peace that Christ offers us is all that we need. Sorry, Ponce de Leon, there is no fountain of youth you will eventually meet your maker. There's only one way to that maker, and that is through Christ. But for those of us who are in Christ, what a beauty, what a beautiful thing to know that God, he shepherds us still. Not only does he save us, but he keeps us and he shepherds us. Through his compassion, he leads us, he comforts us, He didn't just save us and leave us alone and walk away, but he truly has become our father, our father God. And so um, this morning, as we pick up in Isaiah 43, we'll read the first uh, seven verses, and it reads like this. But thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who was called by my name and whom I have created for my glory whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, 
this morning for who you are. God, we thank you for your beautiful word. In it, we find instruction. We find your character. We find the very words that came from your mouth, from your heart. I pray, Lord, this morning that you would protect this holy word from any error and that this holy word would set the Lord Jesus Christ on display, that we would look to the Father, that we would see the Holy Spirit as he dwells with us and comforts us. Now, we thank you for your faithfulness throughout all eternity, throughout these ages, throughout all our troubles and our circumstances. We thank you, Lord, that you still call us, and that you still love us. And just as you were with Israel, you are with us today. So I pray, Lord God, as, as the, your word is preached, may you be set on display for us to see and marvel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This passage written by Isaiah the prophet, it was a man who spoke the words of God to the people of Israel and Judah. And for the most part, these words were words of confrontation, exhortation, and warning, which made Isaiah very unpopular. And even though his message was not always looked at and received with delight from the people that he had spoke to, he continued to speak and write the word of the Lord. And without a doubt, Isaiah's vision in chapter 6 of Isaiah influenced everything he would write and he would say. As Isaiah would share the words of judgment, he would be reminded of the Lord's commission to his life. And God would ask, when God would ask, who will go for us? And it would be Isaiah that said the famous words, here I am, send me. And Isaiah knew going in to what his service to the Lord, he knew it would be that the people would not receive his message. Judah would be conquered, Jerusalem would be sieged, and then carried off into exile. The surrounding nations would also receive judgment, and yet through all this, God will remain faithful to his people, and the promise of the Messiah that Isaiah wrote about would come to pass many centuries later. In his 40 years of preaching doom and promise, the promise did not turn the nation of Judah from its headlong rush toward destruction. But he faithfully preached the message of God gave him until the very end. And just as there was sin in the days of Isaiah, there was also sin in our day. But God still has a remnant of people that still love him and desire to do his will. The scripture confirms that men love darkness. They love it a lot. I remember those days of loving darkness. Being a slave to sin is no joke, yet men feel that they are free, but they are consumed by a desire of wickedness. And that's how our land is today, just as it was in Isaiah's day. Christ came to his own, they received him not. Israel was in a rough place in the days of Isaiah. They had heard and seen the glories of God, and I think they fell in love with the blessing more than they loved the blesser. And what happened was, as Isaiah 1, 3 says, an ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Rough times in Israel at that time. Rough times in our world today. As we see the plan of God starting to unfold, every second that passes is one second closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the process of judgment, Isaiah would look to the future people of God and let them know, despite the sins of their previous generations, there would be hope. God had permitted the Jews to be captured and exiled to chasten them for their sins, but their captivity would not be forever. He would come in judgment and destroy Babylon using Cyrus as his tool. 
And Israel's deportation was designed to destroy any sense of nationalism or political identity. In Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, Isaiah confront, comforted the future generation of weary exiles, the Jews who thought that God had forgotten them. In a brilliant series of prophecies, Isaiah presented the case that Israel's captivity was not due to the superiority of Babylon's idols, but to the disciplining rod of God. He predicted the exiles return and encourage them to rouse themselves, to flee Babylon, and to entrust their future to the Almighty. You see, we can look at our land this morning and look at the world in general and see the desire for wickedness and everything that, God's hate, that God hates growing really fast. Men love darkness. They celebrate it. It hurts us as the children of God because we know that it pains God. It hurts him. And yet the people of our, of, of our world seem to just rejoice in the things of wickedness. And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, it just seems to get worse and worse and worse. And here we have in Isaiah, we have, we have the prophet, and he alone is left as though it seems because nobody seems to listen to his message. Yet the people of God and his church, we have to look to him despite the state of the world and know that he's in control. If you look at the circumstances that the world is in, we as believers might find ourselves anxious, fearful, uncomfortable, and distracted by carnal things, or we can be encouraged and convinced that God is in control looking for his kingdom to come, and eager looking for the beauty of Christ in all things. See, there's a certain way that God shepherds his people. And the book of Isaiah clearly states and shows how God takes care of us. Even through other Old Testament uh, works and prophecies, we look at Micah this morning, chapter 5, verse 4, and it says, And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. You see, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a shepherd king. He takes care of his flock. And this is why the pages of scripture are so important for us to us now. Because it gives us his people assurance that through everything he still shepherds despite the chaos of what seems to be taking place all around us. God is not panicking. He's not frustrated. He is not scared that he can't move his people through the times that they are facing. But instead, he is God and nothing thwarts his plans or interferes with his rule. And this is personal for every believer as well as the body of Christ. We are his people. Can you imagine the helpless sheep with no shepherd? Not so with us. Trying to figure everything out, but being limited, because at the end of the day, that is what we are, just sheep. God's rule and design includes us being totally dependent on him. And this truth continually stays the same throughout eternity. We don't graduate as sheep to be partially dependent or fully dependent of the Lord. You don't say goodbye to your father's house. You will always be dependent on God throughout all eternity. The very breath that is breathed through our nostrils that enters our lungs comes from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he alone holds us together for his glory. I think sometimes that's hard for us because we, we learn about, you know, growing up. One of these days you're going to get older and you're going to be on your own and you'll be your own person. And sometimes that comes into our mindsets when we start to serve God. And as we grow and, and, and we start to say, okay, I'm, I'm ready for this, God. I'm ready to mature. But there's one thing that you'll never mature from. 
You will always, always have to trust in God. That is how it works. You will never get to a point where you say, I got this, God. I'll take care of it. You've showed me well. As you mature in the faith, what happens is, is you truly start to understand and recognize how weak and needy we really are. Everything must come from dependence on the Lord. Our love that it takes to serve him, our faithfulness, that comes from him. Our gratitude. How many times have you been in the presence of the Lord and you've been before him and you say, I don't even know how to, how to be grateful, God. Can you show me how to be grateful? Can you show me how to love you? Teach me to pray. I'm so lost. The sheep must know their master's voice. Those who are familiar with the sheep pen, who trust God to shepherd them, the good shepherd through all things, who trust the truth of his word, have a peace that surpasses all understanding. This doesn't always mean that you're going to understand or like what's going on, but it does mean that you can look to your master. You can look to your shepherd. You might even throw a fit sometimes before God. You're not always going to understand what God is doing. It's like the famous saying when you were a kid before you got it. This is going to, you, you might understand this right now, but you will in the future. Nobody likes that. All right, we, we, we might not always like what God's doing, but we can always understand that he, despite what we feel, we know that he's in control and we can look to him. These verses give Israel in eloquent detail the assurance Christ gives to his church and that the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The children of Israel that the Lord would be speaking this to in this passage would read these words in exile and be in a position of needing God to fulfill his promises. The same place that we are in today. Lord, hear our prayer. Please come for us. We are so dependent. If, if you find yourself here this morning dependent on God, you are in a good place. If you are in a place where you think that you have everything figured out and you'll come to God when you need him, you are not in a good place. We need Christ. He is the good shepherd. He is our father. And we trust in him. There's four things this morning that the children of Israel would need to understand about God as they would read this passage in Isaiah. The first one is this is that number one, God redeemed Israel. Verse one says, But now, thus says the Lord your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you. By name, you are mine. Israel felt the discipline of God. Is that not what the scripture teaches, that God loves us? He disciplines those whom he loves? After hearing of the dominance of David's Israel, they were now in captivity. Perhaps there was fear that they would remain in a foreign land without redemption. The Lord, their creator, would have to remind them that it was he that formed them, and it was they that belonged to him. Deuteronomy 6, 7, 6 says this, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are in the face of the earth. These were God's people. He redeemed them. They belonged to him. In the Old Testament, the word redemption refers to redemption by a kinsman, to rescue or deliverance. And in the Old Testament, the word kinsman is often used as a translation of a Hebrew word that means the one who has the right to redeem. Does not God have the right to redeem his people? Does he have to take his people from someone else because they belong to someone? The truth is, is that we belong to him. It is he and he alone that has the power of creation. 
and making men in his own image, they belong to him. There's nothing that scares God. He is able to take ownership and redeem Israel just as he's able to take ownership and redeem us. As the children of Israel looked around in their condition, they would need to understand that they belong to God by faith. The children of God needed to understand that God claims us. We belong to him. You think about raw intention. Would there be any raw intention to something that belongs to God, that comes from God himself? Discipline, yes, but no raw intention. He's a good shepherd. Us belonging to God is not by chance. It's not random, but he calls us. As we've been learning, those whom he foreknew, predestined, called, justified. Just a few weeks ago. In the same way, the Lord redeemed his people. Christ now redeems his flock by his blood. We belong to God. What a precious truth that we should hold dear to our hearts. If you've ever seen the cartoon Aladdin, you see Aladdin and he's poor. And he lives in the streets. And in his house, he opens up his curtain. And he looks at the palace. And he just wonders what it would be like to be part of that palace. There's no wondering for the children of God. We're in the palace. We belong to him. We have a seat at the table. We belong there not because of anything that we've done. We couldn't redeem ourselves. But because he redeemed them, redeemed us by his blood. And we look to that. And that's the truth that we hold on to. I know that we don't feel like we're redeemable. I know I don't. <laughs> Sometimes you got to look in the mirror and say, why would you save me, God? But he does because we belong to him. The second thing that we see here is God was with Israel. Verse 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor the flame burn you. We as a sheep do not want to be alone. And God is with us. That is something that we have to hold on to. Just recently, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was at my son's tournament. He's a, uh, he had a wrestling tournament at, the, at Columbine High School, where the shootings took place over 20 years ago. And if you've ever been to a wrestling tournament, you know that there's a lot of time between matches. So I had the opportunity to go around where I could, where I was permitted, to just kind of walk through the hallways. And it was very sobering, understanding that years ago, there was young men chasing other people through those hallways with guns shooting at them. And as I was walking around, I happened to see some of the display cases of the support that Columbine had received from famous athletes and famous people throughout, throughout the nation. And there was one overwhelming message that came across as I would read the letters. You are not alone. And that, that message would ring true to those, those students at Columbine High School. And as a parent, I can't imagine, you know, you're having a kiddo that would be running around scared, feeling desperation, feeling alone, not knowing what was taking place, hearing those types of shots. And in the same place, in the same understanding, they would not be alone. God was with them. Didn't seem like it. In the same way for us, God does not leave us alone. He is so close to the flock that he smells like the sheep. We are stinky. He has not abandoned us, even though it may have feel, feels like it sometimes that he has. He's present with his creation from front to back in the Bible and all in between. In Genesis 3.8, it reads, When they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. 
among the trees of the garden. In the very beginning of Scripture, we see God with his people, with his creation. In the Old Testament, we see God, Genesis 39, verse 2 and 3, and the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. Joshua 1.5, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. We see the son in the New Testament. Matthew 1.23, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. At the Great Commission in, in Matthew 28, Christ says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the, the age. The command followed by a promise of Christ's presence. We see the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14 Verse 16 and 17, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be with you. And at the end of the ages in Revelation 21 verse 3, and I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. God will always be with us. We see the famous passages in Psalm 139. If God was not with the psalmist, he would never be referred to as his shield. He is always with us, no matter what we go through. And that's something the children of Israel would have to understand. The particular promise of the river not overflowing them and the fire not scorching or burning them is unique and specific for these particular Israelites. As they would journey back, God would specifically bring them to their destination. See, as believers, we must understand that it's not a question of if the rivers or fires come, but when they come. Maybe these waters quite possibly would be to remind them of the Red Sea at the Jordan. Or perhaps they would point to the children in captivity, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel too, with the fire. Being in front of fire and water is no fun. When we think of fire and water, I don't know one person that wants to burn or drown. I've never seen anybody sign up to be hurt. The point is, is that we have to understand it is him who guides us and has to protect and comfort us. Despite what's taking place, we have to keep our eyes on the prize. So I ask you this morning, what are you facing? Are you looking at the fires? Are you looking at the overwhelming floods of water as they come? Or are you looking to God? You may feel alone, because you do not see him, but you have to know that he is there. That's hard. Sometimes as in my immaturities, I want to see the presence of God. I want to see the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day. I want to know these things, as Ken shared on Friday. I'm jealous. I'm jealous of John, that which we have seen, which we have touched with our own hands. We want to see the presence of God, but we have to understand it is him that is with us through all things. That's why the psalmist David could say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It may seem in your circumstances that you do not sense him. But one of the biggest things that you'll learn in your faith, it's not about what you feel. It is about what you know. And God is with you. Second Corinthians says, 
we walk by faith and not by sight. And Peter follows up in the scripture and he says, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. Number three, God loved Israel. Verse four says, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. God sees things that he has created and has certain things, certain feelings and affections towards his own. And there is no greater affection towards someone than to know, than to show them unconditional love. In this case, this love included discipline. What did it light a couple weeks ago to hear Pastor Davis preach on God's love for us? It's something that words don't do it justice. When you sit there and you meditate that God actually loves me despite who I am. What a beautiful thing. When we see Christ loving his sheep. It is this love that we find rest in. Too many times as believers, we may find ourselves trying to earn this unconditional love that already exists. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you any more than he already does. You just have to rest in that. What does Romans 5a say? It says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in what while we were sinners. Yes, sinners, Christ died for us. He already loved us. And the children of Israel would have to understand as they were looking to Christ to come that it was God who loved them. As they would travel back, as they would face the fires, it was God's love that would keep them. This love is based off of his choosing. Because Israel is precious, honored, and loved, God will give men in exchange for her. That is, judgment will fall on the Gentiles in every direction in order that his sons and his daughters might be restored to the land. In the same way that judgment fell on the Gentiles for the, for those, for the children of Israel, so that judgment fell upon the Son, proving his love. God loves us. Rest in that this morning. The fourth thing, God created Israel for his glory. Verse 5 reads, Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created from my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Pastor Greg said it best last week during Sunday school. God does not exist for us. We exist for him, for his glory. Talking about the fire and the waters, we face those for his glory. That's how he keeps us humble. You can ask any person apart from Christ to tell you what their purpose is for being here on the earth when you're sharing the gospel. Why do you exist? What is your sole purpose? And not one will be able to tell you. You'll get that look in their face where they're like, hmm, that's a good question. I've thought, I've pondered, and I don't know the answer. When you're a child of God, you know why you exist. You exist for him. We can look back Just a few months ago, as we've journeyed with Ken through Romans 8, Romans 8, 28, everything is for our good and his glory. Everything and everyone God creates is for that glory. There is not one who is called that doesn't exist for his glory. And that is why God will call his sons from afar and his daughters from the ends of the earth. For something so detailed to take place, they would have to trust God. And when it did take place, the peoples of the earth could only point to one person, God himself. 
So knowing that we exist for his glory, that puts us in proper perspective of why we're here. Very humbling passage in John 21, 18 and 19, where Jesus is talking to Peter. And he's telling him, after his resurrection, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this, he said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And he had spoken this. He said to them, follow me. That's why we, in, in perspective of the waters and the fires, we have to understand that whatever we go through, it goes to the glory of God. That's why William Tinsdale, in his final words before the chain around his neck strangled him and he was burned at the stake, would be able to say, Lord, open the king of England's eyes, only to know his purpose to glorify God and why he existed would allow him to do something like this. So this morning, in conclusion, if you are a true child of God, you can trust him that he has redeemed you, that he is with you, and that he loves you, and you exist for his glory. May we continually find peace in these truths this morning as we enter into a new year and the world is chaotic and it's crazy. May you know the Lord God is with you and he will guide you. However, if you are not in Christ this morning, this privilege does not belong to you. You have been cast out from the Lord God because of sin separated at the garden, away from God. He still dwells with sinners because his presence is everywhere. But you don't have a good shepherd. You are at war with God. And if you're looking for peace and you cannot find it, you can only find it through the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to have it is through the Son of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can look at this passage of Scripture and know that you are with us. We look to you this morning, O oh God. Even though we don't understand at all times, even though we are a needy people, God, you are our shepherd. Throughout the chaos of this world, throughout what seems to be a lack of control, Lord, we know that you are able and that you exist and that you are here and that you shepherd your people with love and compassion. You dwell with them. You use them to glorify yourself. And that is what we need this morning, oh God. We need you, Lord, as, as we walk through what seems like chaos, what seems as if there's no control. We trust you, Lord. You protect us. You are here with us, and we rejoice in Emmanuel this morning. And we pray, Lord God, that you would call those, Lord, who are out of the, the pen this morning. If there's someone here, Lord, that does not know you, that does not have the peace of God, would you call them into the, the pen? Would you redeem them? Would you love them, O oh God? Would you be with them? God, we give you all the honor and all the glory. We worship the Son this morning, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.